Action. Um, hi. Uh, let's see. My name is uh, Richard Smith, and I run a computer site called uh, Computer Bytes Man. Uh, this is the uh, second talk for me. I did a talk yesterday on tracking uh, criminals on the internet. Uh, today is going to be a little bit different. It's more of a gadget talk, if you will, but it's going to get into uh, uh, some sort of practical applications of gadgets as well as some policy decisions that are going to be made. Um, this is an area that I've been following for, uh, for more than a year and a half. Uh, I originally got into uh, looking at fake face recognition <coughs> software when uh, reading the news stories about what got called the Snooper Bowl, the, uh, uh, the Super Bowl that was not this year's but the previous year's in Tampa, Florida, um, had a face recognition set up so that each person who went through the turnstile was scanned by a face recognition system. And there was a database of uh, about 3,000 people in the Tampa area who wanted to own various kinds of criminal warrants. And so they were, uh, used the Super Bowl as a uh, place to round up the local criminals. The cops found it as a convenient uh, place to do this. It, uh, well, th they claim they matched, got 19 matches, but no arrests. So uh, the, the company said it worked, and I think most people's uh, 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 calculations are really good because no one was arrested. Uh, anyway, the, the system was put in, though, with the idea of, you know, uh, keeping us safe from the terrorists. You know, this was before September 11th, even. Um, the, uh, the company decided to issue a press release that this had happened and then sort of created a, a, a bit of controversy, more than they probably expected. Um, it actually got a Big Brother Award uh, from Privacy International, which I actually gave the nomination for. So. Uh, after that, uh, after that system, uh, the, the next big controversy with face scanning was uh, again in, Tampa, in the Tampa area, where the local police again wanted to round up the, the, uh, the usual suspects and put a uh, face scanning system in uh, Ybor City, which is sort of the entertainment area of, uh, of Tampa, sort of the nightclub and restaurant area, sort of Spanish area. And uh, the same idea was to to equip the, the, the regular closed circuit TV systems, which are throughout that neighborhood, uh, equip them with face recognition so that they could find the local criminals. And uh, again, it's done as a convenience for the police. It just makes them easier to spot people. And they have a, in that particular system, they have a license to put up uh, thir uh, 30,000 people in the database, although they only have a few thousand so far. Um, I actually spoke to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the head, um, the guy at the Tampa Police Department was head of this project, and he you know, gave me the rundown of who, who was in there, and it was kind of interesting. It was, you know, people who wanted on outstanding, outstanding, outstanding criminal warrants, uh, known sex offenders, and um, just general bad people that have been arrested before for, you know, pickpocketing or whatever that they, that they thought might hang out there. Uh, one of the interesting things is uh, they could arrest the people who are wanting on outstanding arrest warrants, but if someone was in the sexual offender registry and wasn't supposed to be in the neighborhood, they weren't allowed to arrest them. All they could do is come up to them and say, you better move along uh, because they didn't have jurisdiction over these people. So there's sort of, these systems have sort of all sorts of uh, interesting policy decisions with them. Um, however, face scanning or face recognition uh, software became a really hot item after September 11th. And it's an interesting study in commerce of why that happened. <coughs> Um, there's basically here in the United States two companies who are, who are the big players in the uh, face recognition software business. One is Visage, and they're up in the Boston area around where I live. And the other company is uh, Visionics, which is now known as Identix. Um, and they're, they have offices of, actually over in Jersey City as well as a couple other places around the country. And basically uh, what happened is that uh, both the companies saw a op business opportunity after 9-11. After to uh, offer security services for airports. And so they came up with this idea of using face recognition systems, equipping every airport with them to look for the, the bad terrorist. And uh, I uh, became a skeptic, kind of skeptic on this on a lot of different levels. And what I hope to do today is sort of impart some of that skepticism here of, of, uh, of you know, what I see as the problem with these systems. Um, and it's very interesting, um, you know, they're very sort of high-tech uh, products in the sense that they take video images and attempt to match up features on people's faces with, with databases. There's a lot of sort of interesting technology into them. 
Um, but there's also a lot of very interesting real-world problems that one must deal with when installing these systems and, and, uh, and uh, consider, you know, how they can really be used. And uh, it's an interesting study also in how, uh, in, the, in times of sort of uh, troubles here with terrorism, that, you know, companies are sort of taking advantage of the situation and making pitches in, on these products. Um, what, what are, first of all, uh, what are some of the uses for the face scanning systems at airports? One is the one that's getting all the press and the one that's making, like, you know, Peter Jennings easing news and so on is, is spotting suspected ter terrorists in the terminals themselves. So the basic idea is that you have, you take your, your CCTVs or other uh, video cameras you've set up and you have a database of known terrorists and, you, and you're looking for them at the airport. And, and the idea is you try to spot them at the airport and if you, if you see somebody in the database, it's visually confirmed by a person, and if, by darn, if it's really one of those terrorists, and you go, you go tackle them in the terminal. That's the basic idea. Um, another thing that can be done is that's being talked about is in some background checks. So that when you can, before you get on the airplane, uh, they figure out they uh, they uh, uh, again the same thing, spotting the terrorists, but are the ones who are actually trying to get on on the airplanes. Uh, a more traditional application for face scanning would be access control t uh, to restricted areas. You know, today at the airport, you know, we're all familiar with the swipe cards that the that the, the, the employees use at the airport, or sometimes keypads, or maybe a, maybe if they're advanced, the fingerprint system. But you could also use face scanning for that. So that's a reverse thing. Your database has the good guys in it, and you're and you're looking for them. And um, another another one is uh, background checks for new hires. Um, that air airports now, um, even though none of the hijackers are involved, you know, work at the airports, there's a lot of concern now about employees at airports. They have access to a lot of, a lot of equipment in, in the airlines, and we need to do background checks on them. So, as a minimum, uh, the government's forcing all uh, airports to run fingerprint uh, checks on people. But another thing you can do is a face scan if you have some kind of database of bad people. I've talked. Uh, one of the questions is, well, how does uh, how does a face scanning system work? And it's, it's actually pretty straightforward, you know, at least for this crowd, I don't think you have you know, too much trouble understanding the basic idea. Uh, but you really have two, two, basic, um, uh, two basic components, is you have a video camera and you have a computer with a video, com uh, a video uh, converter on it that will convert, you know, digitizes it, or you have a digital camera to begin with. So basically you have a, uh, the video camera set up at some location that can get good shots of people's faces, you know, you know, pointing at the right, the right level for face shots. And that goes into, uh, it's fed into the computer, uh, converted into digital screen, uh, digital, into a digital format. And then um, what the face scanning software does is it looks for the eyes on the picture. So first it spots a face and uses algorithms for locating where the face is. And then within that uh, square, it looks for the two eyes and uses that as sort of an anchor point. And then um, it recognizes other features on the face, you know, your nose, uh, where your mouth is, and cheeks, and so on, and then takes various measurements. Um, and from this, it creates a digital template, which is, you know, sort of a, kind of like a long number, which represents who you are. Um, you know, now each time you take a picture, you're going to get a little bit different number for there, but uh, for people, uh, you tend to end up with the same sort of digital template all the time. And then the second component is you have a database of, of pictures in it, of photos, that you've somehow taken at some other previous point in time, and then you have an algorithm that takes that template that you've just measured for the picture you've taken, and then you match it against each person in the database. And then you come up with a list of pictures that seem to be close to that, to that person. And if you have a, if you're looking for the bad guys, that sounds the alarm and says, "Wait a minute, we got a bad guy here." If you've got a good guide system, you know where you're letting access into, say, a, a, an enclosed area, it unlocks the door. You know, so it can go either direction. But the whole idea is you alarm if you get a close enough match. Yes. Yeah. Well, well yeah, I will. I uh, will talk about that. I have some some real pictures there. But uh, yeah, these guys have thought about it. That was something like. Uh, it's one of the problems of, of doing these systems. Okay. Um, so, but the, we have this concept of the alarm, and the alarm can either be a good alarm or a bad alarm, depending on the kind of system that we're trying to build. Um, 
Now we get into the matching system, and, and I actually played around with the Visionics Faceit software. And uh, you know, each software package works a little differently, but this is the, the same idea across the different vendors. Um, if we have two photos that we want to me measure, we have the two templates um, where we've taken all these measurements. And uh, if I've got it right, I think templates are about 80 bits, but I could, or it might be 80 bytes, I think. Uh, but what we do is we have an algorithm that matches two templates together, and then it rates the match on a scale from 0 to 10, where 0 means no match whatsoever, and 10 means identical match. And um, we then have a, a, a threshold value where we say if the matching value is greater than or equal to the threshold, then we probably, this picture, these two pictures represent the same person. And in the case of uh, Visionics, they have a default value of 8.5. Um, however, you can adjust that. You can adjust that value one way or the other. I do have a quick question here. I was actually going to start off with this, but now I just remembered this. Uh, do we have any Law & Order fans here in the crowd? Just show of hands the TV program. Uh, Criminal Intent had a show a few weeks back here, at least it was on, I, on, I taped it, where they used face recognition system. Did you see this show where they had this, the hack, this is the, the hacker guy who's stalking the, the, the woman with, he put video cameras in her. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was it's sort of, this really appropriate for this audience. So the hacker guy was stalking this woman uh, in her apartment with video cameras. And uh, they, the, the cops discovered the cameras, but didn't know who put him in there. Anyway, they traced it all back. He had a website where he was observing her and all this stuff. Um, but as an ironic uh, moment, is the way that they caught him uh, was using a face recognition system. And so it was sort of, you know, there he was videotaping, but he got caught by the video video system. And uh, in the in the in the show, they did a pretty good job on the face recognition part because they said, "Oh yeah, we cranked the thing down really low." So uh, so they ended up having two false. Positives first. They they grabbed two guys who wasn't the guy, and then the third one turned out to, turned out to be the person. Um, but it just shows you know. And if they said right in the show, yeah, we set that threshold down really low just to make sure we could catch them. Um, so you know, there's a little bit of art, if you will, of choosing that right threshold value. If you set it too high, you'll miss the bad guys. Or if you're building a good guy system, you won't let the good guy you know, in through the door, and that's really bad. You know, if you've got somebody trying to do a job and they can't get through the door to get to their place, that's bad. Um, also, but, you know, if you've got a bad guy system, you're, you're, that system's in there to catch people. Um, if you set it too low, you get the reverse problem, which is the system cries woof, and, and it will uh, say two people are the same person when they're really not, and that's that, what happened there on uh, Law and Order. They had two people that they, they, they misidentified. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, it's a little hard for me to hear. Here, Can you use the microphone? Yeah. Please, please, when you have a question, go up to the mics. So that you won't. Yeah, so I can't get full by pressure. Oh, uh, yeah, some systems liveliness, some systems have that, but... Uh, you turn it off because it might be in the crowd, it might be quite inconvenient. Yeah, um... It's like, you know, you think of the North Arnold. Right, system. most systems I know don't really, uh, don't have that kind of protection. Oh. And, yeah, because they're just, they're just watching a video signal all the time, trying to grab, grab the pictures. Yeah. Uh, but that's another, uh, we'll get into some of the, some of the, uh, the problems here of making this all work. So, uh, if we set the... The, the threshold too low, uh, we'll, we'll finger innocent people or we'll let the, innocent, the wrong guys through the door if we're building a good guy system. And every, if everything is just right, then, then we have, uh, uh, we've got a system where it's not crying wolf and we're always letting the right people in. Uh, the trouble is it's really kind of impossible to come up with just right value. Um, so we end up trying to sort of balance out uh, between the too high and the too low depending on our application. Um, now, playing around with uh, uh, the FaceIt software, uh, I found that the matching algorithms were very sensitive, and uh, you, you had to have really good images for the system to work. 
Um, so some of the things that would affect uh, the ability to match what one is lighting, that you had to have good lighting when, you, when you're taking the picture. Uh, also the background, you wanted like a clean background if there are other act objects in the background that mess things up, which is sort of strange because it really comes, focuses in the face, but it still solves problems. Uh, facial position and expression uh, matter, you know, so that as I smile or, or turn my head, that would affect the algorithms. Uh, even just wearing, wearing glasses or sunglasses. Sunglasses in particular are really bad. Basically, with the Visionic system, you cannot wear sunglasses. And they've even, I saw a presentation um, on their system, they even said you have to take sunglasses off. Now, in an airport, you can tell people, that, you know, you're going to have to do that when, whenever this, the camera's around. But if you're doing stuff on the sly, say like in Ybor City, you don't maybe have that luxury. Um, you also have camera position. You know, somebody already mentioned that, whether it's up or down or whatever. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of factors that go in here of, of, of when you set up a face recognition system, you basically have to control the environment where the camera's in. Um, and this is, a, this is very important, this is very important for, for this to work. You just can't throw a camera up any place and just hope it works. Um, I want to go over here now to some actually, uh, some of the tests that I ran here to just give you some ideas here. Um, this is, uh, these are various pictures that I took. I had a, like a little database, a bad, I guess this is a bad guy database, or a good guy. I don't know which way, way this is, but um, I had a database of three pictures of myself, and then I would try out uh, various poses and, and think in various situations to see how that affect matching. So you can see at the top there, uh, the top two pictures, you know, came in pretty good, 7.8 and, and, and 8. I actually lowered the lighting, and it, and it worked out a little bit better um, with the database, you know, pictures that I had. Um, you put a hat on, you can see that drop drop my down, thing down to 7.7, .7, and I wear glasses, you know, the 7.6, and, you know, compared to 7.8. So there's a little bit of effect here, uh, but if we set a, uh, a threshold of 7.5, we, we would still catch all these here. Uh, supposedly it doesn't matter, but my wife would kill me if I shaved. I couldn't run that test, you know, my wife just wouldn't. I'd, um, but you can see here, if I look up, if my eyes are looking up, that drops it. If I smile, that drops it. Um, close the eyes. Remember, eyes are used as the anchor point, so that had a pretty, pretty lowering effect. And if I look down, but you know, you can see really, uh, sunglasses just kill this system. All of a sudden, we go from seven two to five nine here on this. So you know, this is why Visionic said you must take sunglasses off for their system to work. But the more interesting cases really are down here as, as, as you look away. Um, and as I, you know, I didn't measure that 20 degree turn, but you can see, I see, you can still see my eyes and I'm not really turned that far away from, from the camera. And, and it's just totally messed the system up. So uh, in, in, a, uh, in a situation where you're looking for the terrorists, you may have an opportunity to look at two or three or four frames. So, but if they've got their head turned away from, 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 from the camera, at just the right time, then the system's not going to not not going to recognize them. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert at the at, at their software, so uh, that would be a good question to them, and I can't I can't I can't answer that question. What it, what it seemed to me was um, what, what's interesting here is in the database the database that I have, I had all good pictures of myself. You know, they were posed pictures that I was, you know, like you do for a driver's license or something like that. So a lot of these same factors kick in on the database photos. You know, what if your head is turned when the, for the photo in the database? So uh, what I kind of found is that it did match up better if I had two pictures where they were both turned away, that gave a fairly decent match. But, you know, so if the terrorist is looking this way, well, one time and this way or the other time, you know, there'd be no match possibilities at all. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I, I bet it'd be like the sunglasses, but I didn't think of that one. Yeah, so I, I think people would kind of look at you yeah, at the airport, but sunglasses, you know, that'd be pretty, pretty normal, normal thing. And so they say, you got you to take them off. Yeah. Really 
it's a, that's a good question. Again, that's another test. That's another, another test I made. But you know, clearly, if you want to put one of these systems in, those are the kinds of tests you need to run. I just didn't think of all those. You know, <laughs> you know, eye patch or, or thicker glasses or anything like that. But th those are the kinds of tests you'd want to run here for for a real installation. Yeah. Could you guys use the microphone, please? We need yeah. to get it recorded. Okay, I'll, I'll try to say the questions. Yeah, the question is, is if you use makeup and you put, uh, put like a fake, a fake nose on or something like that, could you fool the system? Uh, that, might, that may. It depends on if it's something being measured. But I know that facial hair doesn't. They don't really look too much at the mouth. So, uh, you know, as you saw up there, when I smiled, that changed things some, so not a lot. Yeah. yeah I was personally thinking about a hat or, or a cap that had all these fake eyes over it because the system didn't <laughs> eyes so much. Right. Yeah, so, so what is that? That's sort of the rest me on the terrorist hat, yes. <laughs> I don't think you need the face recognition for that one, but yes. There's... <laughs> well, version two of the study, I should, I'll have to try all these. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of some of these, these tests. Yeah. There's, uh, we, we have a, in Holland, we have an OCR system in place for reading license plates. And the license plates are, are nice bright yellow with black letters on it, and it's about this big and all the letters are the same font and really wide and nice. Uh, so I figured, um, and they're doing now speed checks where they check speed over a trajectory, checking your license plate in and out of, uh, out of, a, out of a given range of highway. Um, so I thought of, of actually uh, devising a company logo for the back of the car, which consists of all these license plate elements sort of, sort of splattered <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in one giant explosion. Because the system, all these systems work by scoring different elements in the frame for what's the chance of this being the eyes as opposed to that, or this as opposed to that. So yeah. these algorithms work, it really, it really helps you to screw, screw them up. Yeah, well, we don't want to help the terrorists too much, so let's not give too many ideas here. <laughs> Although, we'll, we'll get it. I think there's plenty of other problems that we don't worry about. Yeah. Um, maybe it was covered already. I walked in a little late. So forgive me if, yeah. if this was talked about already. But um, as far as the system goes, are you, does it use one photo? Per person, or is it multiple photos? You can put multiple photos in. Okay, because I was going to say, um, you know, would it be possible to say, you know, to devise a system that would take an average of all the keys generated by different pictures, like say, head down, eyes closed, eyes open, and do an average of all the, all the numbers for the photos? There, there, there may be that possibility. The system doesn't have only has one. It doesn't have this concept of multiple photos per person. You can put them in, but there's no correlation between them, between them. So I, that's a good question for physionics, but I just I don't know the answer for it, so. Okay, but you can put multiple photos in. And so some, some photos may track better than other ones. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you have multiple photos of a person in different positions, then it will match them. Yeah. If you're looking for them, the best right, yeah. photo of them will, yeah. will be matched, right? Right, you're right, exactly. So does it, what do they do about aging or about... Uh, I'll get into that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's asking, yeah. Uh, sort of the reverse of what I'm interested in, you know, how to fool the system. Um, I'm more interested in when the system is set, if, if you set the system to 9.9 .9 or something, mm -hmm. what is the reliability that when it does hit a match, that it is actually a match? Okay. Um, I'll get into that, but if I don't, remind me. Okay, because we'll, 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 uh, that's part of the sort of the, catch, the catching thing here. Okay, so, uh, you know, on this part here, uh, you know, the main thing you can see that this is not sort of perfect technology by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, by the way, you know, I actually showed, did this dog and pony uh, for Boston Logan Airport who was considering putting this system in. And uh, I, only, I only was given 10 minutes. And, but anyway, the, the, one of the ladies said, thank you very much. The, the way they got me off the stage was, and she says, you know, it was, you know, I, we really, uh, she says, I, I, she kind of implied my pictures were uh, less than flattering, let's say. <laughs> um, and, but, but it was a good joke at the time. It was, it was a nice lightened up thing here. Um, I, I think she was thinking of my smile pictures here. But as you can see, just you know, turning at, at, different, at different places, we get different match levels. And then these are the database pictures here. <coughs> Some of them, yeah, that one I'm kind of grim. There. I guess maybe that's the one she didn't like. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't. I mean, you know, um, uh, the, but those are all those are all good things. It'd be interesting to see how, how they how they match up. But yeah. 
Do you think ears are a big part? Yeah, well, um, I don't know. I don't believe so. I don't believe they're part of the algorithm. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, there was a question about age. And uh, so what I did was I took uh, various pictures uh, that I had snapshots that I had in, you know, in, in the shoebox in my house, scanned them in, and then just did a, did a, did a check here. Now, um, what, it, what it looked like, you know, so I have these pictures here, you know, 83, 89, 93, 96, 98, and 2000, and then I just sort of cross, did all the cross between them here. And what my feeling was, um, I'm not a great statistician, and my eyes here are a little bit bad, but it seemed like uh, there were still good matches between different years, but the, the closer the pictures were in time, the better the matches were. You know, you just sort of look at that top row, you know, you get your best match in 8-1, then it drops 7-5, but then it goes back up. But, uh, you know, there's some exceptions here, but, uh, you know, the, there, there is some age effect, but it's not that bad. You know, there's almost a 20-year span on here, and we're getting pretty good match values. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Are these systems due by a specific group? Um, not really, no. No, they're just set up. They're just doing matches of templates. So uh, there may be, it's, there are some people that were, were any kind of biometric system works worse than, than, than other people, and so there may be ethnic groups that tend to work worse, but it, pretty much no, there's not really any ethnicity sort of biases built in here as, as far as I know. Yeah, you can't, you know, for one thing, yeah, there's no way you can say, uh, you know, like spot all the Arabs for me, you know, um, or spot all the Americans, or you know, spot all the Brits, you can't do that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, maybe, to some degree, yeah, I think, yeah, you could that that you could probably do, but not with this software. You'd have to have different software. But I, yeah. What are the points that you look at to recognize besides the eyes? It's just basically this area of the face. I, I in a lot of and there's something they claim up to 80 points, but it's sort of that area. Okay. Just to give you an idea of the pictures here. You know, all these have beards though, so I don't have any non-beard ones. This passport photo. Yeah, they 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 <laughs> they, they do say that. Uh, yeah, it's it's after about age sixteen um, that that your face stabilizes. Okay. Um, here's some the hijacker test page, which is kind of fun. Uh, uh, I grabbed these photos off the FBI website. And you can see we got a pretty good match, 8.4 between these two photos. And, and to, to my eyes, the one on the left, he, you know, he gained some weight. You know, he was a good eater there. Um, but 8.4 is a, a good match. So you can see just uh, you know, aging effect doesn't didn't matter here. Uh, you know, here's another one. Those are very different pictures. I think a lot of people would say, hmm, is that really that same guy? But they came up pretty good there. Um, and you know we had a lower we had lower quality pictures here. Even on the left one, it claims excellent. I don't think anybody called it excellent, but uh, you know that's that's a fairly low one. Okay. The next uh, the next thing here is um, well, let's take those two different tests and combine them together. <laughs> yeah. So match me up against the hijackers here. 7.4, that's a pretty good match. <laughs> you know, what's kind of scary, though, is I keep matching up to that same guy here. <laughs> yeah, well, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, so, um, I probably wouldn't set the alarms off here, but, uh, you know, I kind of came, came kind of close. Close that 7.4 is a little closer. I, you know, I kind of thought... 7.5 threshold be a good one, you know. So I came pretty, pretty, pretty darn close there on, on, on these here. Uh, but these other ones there were not, not, not too good of matches. But I, I come up, this guy, I'm, I got a lot in common with him. I'm not sure what. All of these values are not scaled according to the size of the database or within a large corpus of other faces. It's all just absolute individual matches. Right, yes, right. So the probability of a, mis a mismatch is going to grow, you know, as the, the size of the database gets bigger, then the probability will be better if it messes up. Okay.
Okay, um, so that was, I gave you, you know, what my actual results were there here, and these are some of the, here's some of the, uh, some of the things I noticed. Uh, you know, lighting makes a big difference, uh, makes a big difference in image quality. Uh, a good neutral background is good. Sunglasses fool the system, which Visionics now says publicly. They didn't used to. It's kind kind of interesting. They didn't didn't mention that problem. Now they do. Um, I got said I got many false negatives. I, they recommend a default threshold of 8.5. I thought it's way too high. I never even got close to that match, you know. And I thought 7.5 was was pretty good. Uh, so if I had 7.5 threshold, I got no real false mat positives. But I didn't do really extensive testing. Um, and so for same people, you know, I you know I definitely saw the system kind of working, you know, which is. Uh, I guess I did get some, I got one nine value. So for the same person, I got match values between seven and nine for different people. Typically saw, you know, five and a half to seven. You know, so you can see the system kind of does match up with people as long as you have good quality images. Um, but let's move on now to away from the sort of the techie side of things and start looking at the system issues here. Um, in order for the face recognition, a face recognition system to spot the terrorists at the airport, you're going to have to build a database of the bad guys. So um, that's an immediate problem there. If we think about, um, let's say Al-Qaeda might have, today I was just reading in the newspaper, 5,000 members in, that are still in Pakistan. Um, the, the question is, is, is uh, where are we going to get the pictures for those people? I mean, they're not exactly lining up to have their pictures taken. You know, we do have a picture of bin Laden. We have pictures of his, uh, of his uh, lieutenants. But it's ser I seriously doubt we have pictures of those other 5,000 members. So for this system to catch the terrorists at the airport um, doesn't seem possible because we're just not going to have the pictures for those people. So this idea that we're going to use these systems to catch terrorists doesn't seem very reasonable. Um, now, if you go to the uh, September 11th hijackers, um, we, they actually knew two of them were suspected uh, terrorists. Uh, so, you know, we had a little better luck there. Uh, there was a guy named Nawaf Azami and Khalid uh, Alamandar. And um, they may have, I wrote here that they had photos of one of them. They probably had photos of two of them. What happened is in late 1999, they observed these two guys in Malaysia um, having a meeting with someone who's known to be a member of Al Qaeda, and this the Malaysian, uh, you know, intelligence folks, you know, observed this meeting. They didn't record it. There were probably pictures from that meeting, but not 100% sure. Um, but both hi hijackers had they were allowed into this country after that meeting. Um, and they actually entered the, the country twice. They left and came back again. Um, now, what's sort of interesting here, if you want to find Nawaf, um, he was pretty easy to find. He was listed in the white pages of the phone book. Um, so uh, this, this idea that we need a face recognition system to catch these guys seems kind of silly. Unfortunately, what happened was the CIA recognized this guy was probably, in their terminology, dirty in the, in the year 2000. They didn't let the FBI and, and INS know until August of, of, of 2001. So for 18 months, these guys were running around, known dirty guys. But for some reason, the CIA didn't, didn't mention this to anyone. Um, but face scanning might have caught these guys. It was possible. You know, we shouldn't discount that. But um, there's probably other ways to catch these guys uh, uh, you know, beforehand. Um, some things about setting up face scanning systems at the airport. Um, I wrote this before they installed any systems, and it turns out the rules are exactly what they did. You generally can't use existing surveillance cameras. You need to set up new cameras. You've got to have a walkway where the system is, is uh, where lighting is strictly controlled. There's no windows. It's the best way to do it. And then just put in artificial light. Um, and then you force people to walk down a single file line. And uh, the cameras must be kind of at head you know, at, at, at uh, head height, and you sort of walk into a wall where the camera is, and, and the passengers must look straight, and you've got to remove sunglasses, 
And then you need a human being that when you get a hit to verify, okay, we've got two people here that the computer says match, do they really match? So you need to really have human backup. Um, now I attended a airport security conference two weeks ago or three weeks ago where Visionics made a presentation. They did an installation at the Statue of Liberty um, over a weekend when there were some terrorist, vague terrorist threats against the Statue of Liberty. And, uh, the uh, gentleman from Visionics described the setup there and it was like identical to this list. So I, I had never even professionally installed one of these systems, but you could just see from, from just using the software that these systems are, are fairly quirky and they, and they need, to be, need to have special care and, and this is the same list that they had. Now, when we get into, um, when we get into uh, the accuracy question, uh, which was asked earlier, um, overall, my guess is if you had a terrorist walk through and you had good, pic you know, good pictures of them in the database, that you have about a 50% chance of, of getting a match. The vendors claim more around like 90%, um, but it feels more like 50, and these folks felt um, uh, at the uh, uh, International Biometrics Group that even under ideal control conditions, systems a system succeeded in identifying individuals from a given database only a little more than half the time. So vendors are claiming like 90%, independent testers seem to end up around 50%. But that is, is predicated on one very important thing. You can control everything at the airport, but you got to have good pictures of the terrorist, and you don't control that situation. You know, so even, you know, even if you've got a picture of the terrorist, it doesn't mean it's going to be up to the standards of being able to put in that database and work well. So that's, what, that's why this is iffy. Now, see, if you're doing a good guy system where you're doing access control, where you allow somebody to go through the door, you're enrolling them into the system, and uh, you control both sets of photos, you know, when they're at the door as well as when they're enrolled. So it's a different, different problem. But when you're looking for terrorists, you don't control those pictures in the database. Now, what's extremely interesting is there's been about a half a dozen tests of these, these systems at airports. Um, I actually got scanned at Boston Logan Airport because they set one up for the, uh, the Winter Olympics. So I was flying out to Salt Lake, and I got scanned there. Um, the, uh, the way they test these systems is they put in their, into their quote-unquote bad guy database. They create some kind of bad guy database, which I understand is they just download pictures from the FBI website like I did. So they're relatively small, a few, hundred, a few hundred photos. But then they take and put employees of the airport into the database also. They're not actually trying to, with these test systems, they're not actually trying to catch anybody. They just keep statistics. And so they put in pictures of employees in these databases, and then they measure, you know, they count how many times they recognize employees. But of course, those pictures of employees are good controlled pictures. They're not what you would have for terrorists. So they claim all these great you know, success rates of 80 or 90 percent, but it's kind of cooked with cookbooks, I mean, in my opinion. And I was talking with someone who actually is supervising some of this stuff, who works for the TSA, the group that's uh, looking at uh, putting these systems in. And he says, oh yeah, down at uh, St. Uh, St. Uh, St. St. Petersburg, they, they put in the cops into the database, and they took their pictures exactly at the same place with the same cameras that they use for scanning. And that's just not going to be what, the way it is for terrorists. So one needs to be very skeptical when you hear about hear about these systems. Yeah. Right, um, and that and you and you kind of stole my thunder here. Thanks. Uh, um, yeah, no, no, but that brings up, the, yeah, that brings up the, that, and that, that's exactly the point here, is if you start looking at all this, you know, we're going to install, you know, we maybe install these systems in airports, and uh, we can't catch terrorists with them, but it, that same thing goes. We, we definitely have mug shots of the local bad guys. So that's who we'll put into the database. And it'll be just like the Super Bowl, where we have, um, you know, we just simply use the airports as a convenient place to low, round up the usual suspects. And this is exactly the point that I made at Logan Airport when I, said, I presented to them. I said, is Logan Airport the right place to be, lo you know, rounding up the local bank robbers? You have enough problems with security already. Do you want to take on a burden of the local police department? 
And, and the answer was, they said was, the head of, head, of, head of Logan Airport says, yeah, we don't care. That's a, you know, that sounds fine to us. He says, the reason that we want these systems in is for a deterrent effect that the next time that there's a hijacking, it isn't done from Boston Airport because the bad guys think we have this system that'll catch them. And um, that seems to be, and I, the same sentiment was echoed at this airport security conference that I went to, that it's more to scare people than, than anything else. If, 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 if the bad guys think it's going to work, then they'll, then they'll stay away. And they may ha they, there may be something to that. I don't want to say that it's totally, totally bogus. But what I do think is these systems, as far as catching terrorists go, probably aren't going to work, and it's going to be much more that let's just look up, you know, local bank robbers or deadbeat dads or whatever we decide as criminals who, who, who we're going to who we're going to get with these systems. Yeah, Adam. Technical difficulties. Uh, supposedly, casinos were using this a lot in the years past. Yeah. And what's their experience with this? Uh, especially in Las Vegas, I saw a special on the yeah. channel. They said they're using yeah. this to catch cheaters. Great. And another, 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 guy, another guy spoiled my thing. No, <laughs> that, was, that was perfect timing on that. Uh, I think the casinos, if you look at that application, it really shows you how technologies find their ecological niche. Um, that face recognition has all these sorts of problems or limitations. Uh, so the casinos, what they've bought into the idea of face scanning to look for, you know, known cheats. So what they do is the casinos get together and they build a database of all the bad guys, well, I mean, sorry, the cheats. And I'll put that in quotes and I'll tell you why in a minute why I put it in quotes. And they have companies who run these systems for them. So um, for, for them, you know, a casino might pay $200,000 a year to run the service, but if it, as long as it, uh, if it stops a million dollars worth of cheating, it's paid for itself. The ROI on that is quite good. And so for their standpoint, they're just working off the statistics. So, you know, even if this system only gets 10% of the cheats that walk in, it might, you know, it could be higher, because they do control the pictures and when people go in the database, it should be higher. It's just a good, good return on investment. Now, what's interesting about those systems is, well, like, well, who goes on that database? And, um, you know, who, who, like, who decides? Well, you know, certainly if you got somebody who's stealing chips from the table or, you know, and I, you know, you watch the Discovery Channel and they show you all those, che you know, you know che physical cheats where they grab stuff. You know, those are crooks. You know, so we could say, well, th those are okay that we put in. But they also consider card counters crooks. And card counters are simply people who know how to play blackjack better than the casino does. And they're labeled by the casino as crooks, and they get, you know, excluded from going in and playing blackjack. And so you can really see, you know, sort of the, um, sort of the, uh, sort of say, civil rights issue side of this thing here is, is left up to the casinos. And, you know, they're excluding people that I don't think should be excluded, you know, just because you have to memorize cards in your head and you've learned how to sort of calculate some odds in your head and you know when the right time to bet and not bet, that doesn't seem like cheating to me. Um, so, but anyway, they're using these systems to keep those kind of people out. Yeah. As a civil rights attorney, I'm concerned about the misuse of the system. And I was just wondering if they're going to put white collar criminals into the database for a lot of CEOs not be able to take airplanes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a great place to round them up. Right. You know, because that's who fly, you know, business people fly. Right. Uh, but but but, the, but no, that's the good point, is these systems, um, fundamentally it gets down to who gets to make that decision and who goes in the database, you know, what's the, the legal standard for putting people in there? You know, mostly what they talk about is people who are wanted, you know, for, you know, jumping bail, or there's an outstanding arrest warrant for them. And it's not, you know, with the exception of one thing I heard in Ybor City, it's not for people just known to be bad, but it's people who've actually been, you know, they're looking for but also it opens up a door for misuse. I had personal experience where they didn't use, they just used videotapes. There was a demonstration in front of City Hall in New York, um, in front of City Hall in New York, and they used videos of a past demonstration and they thought they caught someone that was supposedly beating up on a cop. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the demonstrators got hold of me and with the Mass Defense Committee National Lawyers Guild, went down to the police station and the two cops that were holding him admitted that he didn't even look like the guy in the video, mm -hmm. but they still put him through the system when we did a police lineup. Unfortunately, he wasn't recognized. Yeah. But this could be really used just to harass people, to stop them for like hours, missing important flights, whatever. Yeah. And it's, 
to me, it's very scary that it's another techno fix, and you know, we be, have to really be wary of, of misuse of uh, right. Yeah, methods. there's no doubt about these systems. Uh, depending on what level they get put into, uh, you know, can have some very, very, you know, really bad effects. Um, I mean, that's 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 what my concern is, and they're going under the guise of you know, you know, keeping us safe from the terrorists, but they just don't, they can't be used that way. Um, the other part of this too is somebody who travels on airplanes a lot. Uh, there's two error rates that we need to talk about uh, when we're talking about these systems. One is the, the uh, you miss somebody that's really the bad guy, but then the other reverse is that you finger somebody and say, this is a bad guy, when he really isn't. So the question is, is well, what happens in that situation? How do you handle it? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need a human being to go and, and, and match up the two pictures and say, oh yeah, they look like, kind of look the same. Well, then what do you do? You know, if they do, you know, if the human being says they match, then you need to send some security people over and talk to that person. Well, what if he runs? Or what if he, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of what ifs there of how you handle that situation. And, and uh, it can be pretty disruptive at the airport. And you have to consider that the number of terrorists that are going to be going through, a, through the airport that are going to be in the database is going to be, you know, one in 500 million maybe. But the number of false positives you're going to get is about one person the system is the software is going to say about once once every one or two airplanes is is the rate the error rates they're around anywhere as low as a half a percent up to two percent so you have this whole question of you know of of you know one or two plane loads of somebody being figured as a terrorist and so you start thinking about that and well what's going to happen is that the, the security people are just going to give up on this they're just going to let people go because they they're, they're never going to see a terrorist and they're going to keep seeing all these all the system constantly crying wolf so there's a lot of sort of very interesting policy decisions that have to be worked out. And this came up at this airplane security conference. People who design security systems for airports in similar kinds of systems have very sim uh, have similar problems. So it's, it's not cut and dry how you make these things work. Yeah, we have two. What kind of uh, studies have they done on twins or, or family members with obviously similar uh, facial uh, characteristics? Uh, I, haven't I haven't heard. Okay, Thanks. so I'm, so, I, I'm sorry on that one, but that's another good one to run there. I just need to find a twin. Yeah. Two questions back here. Okay. How susceptible is the system to disguise and other countermeasures? Well, the the the, uh, the, the clear one is you know sunglasses you know uh, kills it, but if you add a fake beard on or whatever, that shouldn't. It's this physical area of the face, so it you know like a fake nose, but I think you, people would kind of notice it. No, that wouldn't do it. No, no. Um, this may be slightly beyond the scope of, of this discussion, but one of the things that occurred to me when you were talking about casinos is, um, you know, an ongoing theme in American public life is the privatization of previously public spaces like malls, and I'm wondering what if any protections are in place for images collected in public spaces or in the sort of quasi-public spaces like malls. And where all these images go? I mean, once the system's got a picture of me walking through the airport, what the access chain is behind that, the security company, and then? OK. Well, in the, in the face recognition systems, um, what Visionix uh, loves to say is uh, no match, no, no memory. They automatically discard the image after that. However, you know, for, uh, in general, for CCTV systems, or so security cameras, in general, there's, it's usually uh, uh, recorded on some kind of, uh, you know, slow, slow uh, v VHS tape. You know, they build these special VHS recorders that save that stuff away. It, in general, uh, you know, it's in the security department to have these tapes. They, they, they might recycle them once every few weeks or once every few months, depending on the on the retention policy of the company, and then after that, they're discarded. Um, so, you know, the bad news, yeah, this stuff's, your images are saved a lot. Uh, but that's the bad news. The good news is nobody actually almost ever looks at them. That there, No human being actually is, is looking at them. But that's what's interesting about face recognition, is now you have a computer that's actually trying to look at the, the, at the images. You know, so you can imagine all sorts of Big Brother applications for this stuff way beyond what these companies are currently talking about now. It's very, very interesting. Um, there's an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine where uh, the gentleman, uh, Joseph Attic, who, who was president of Visionic, said, 
don't worry, we'll never go the really bad route on these systems because I won't write, I won't write the software to, to make this happen. And, you know, I thought a, a level, you know, that was sort of very arrogant, you know, he's sort of saying, you know, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the benevolent big brother and I'm not going to do bad things. You know, I'm the techie, I'm in control here, you know, don't worry. Um, and, and pretty clearly, uh, there are some very interesting policy decisions that need to be made about these systems. Um, and this time, I, you know, I, I, I'm skeptical about whether we can do that, and we seem to be heading more towards a lot more surveillance. But there's plenty of, you know, problems with just general surveillance cameras, um, you know, today. So, okay, we got five minutes, so we got to time for a few more questions. Um, the uh, face recognition yeah. that you see here was developed by the United States government to a program called FERRET, F-E-R-E-T, over the early 90s. They subsidized the research that went into both Visionics and Visage systems, and then asked them to bring product to market, and then proceeded to test the product. So it's been going on since 93. I don't, I'm not a conspiratist or anything like that, it was just the way it happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they did FRVT face recognition vendor test 2000, and the PDF of the results, the 16 meg of results, the charts of the zoom, you see where I'm, uh, you see where operating characteristics. Oh, okay. No, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and uh, they just, uh, there were only uh, five vendors in the original one, and all but three dropped out. Uh, they're running that again. They've finished the tests. The results will be out on the website. This is the uh, NIST does this, and uh, you'll be able to see that. This year they had, I think, at least 15 different companies coming to have their stuff tested. Uh, the, uh, the, the, two co the, the CEO of the two companies, uh, Attic and Colosidi, Colosidi, Colotoski. Oh, he retired, but he, he retired. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they did not behave well as businessmen during this period. They hyped their technology terribly, and then they both took profits. And, uh, yeah. uh, so it was a very unfortunate circumstance. And, uh, the, um, the NIST tests are very interesting because this is an attempt uh, to do a systematic study of these systems, uh, kind of along the lines that I was doing there with looking at various you know, false positive and false negative rates and, and the effects of lighting and these sorts of things. Now, what's going to be interesting is um, when the vendors, when the results come out, they're going to continue hyping those results, um, and they're going to use uh, the, the NIST test as, an, as, as am ammo to say, hey, we're ready to go into airports now. Um, I know that's going to happen. Uh, why I think the NIST tests are probably going to ha are not going to be applicable for the terrorist application is they're not, really they're not really getting into this question of how many pictures of terrorists do we have and what are the quality of those pictures. Yeah. yeah, they're setting that thresh threshold really, really low. Yeah, that, and that's that's like in law and order. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've seen also U.S. Army test that was done. This was done more informally, and they were sort of similar similar kinds of results here. And that that's the game you have to have to play. So I got quite time for one more question here. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't know if you had already mentioned this because I came halfway through it, mm -hmm. but um, I do remember reading something in the New York Times about uh, England, and specifically London for the most part, and talking about their implementation of cameras mm -hmm. all over the city. And uh, they, I guess they've been doing it for quite a few years now, at least three years, because they're really afraid of terrorism and, mm -hmm. um, and all their problems with Ireland. And mm -hmm. uh, one thing that they said is that in three years, um, the only people they've ever caught are, you know, known criminals who have done little petty burglaries, and what they're really looking for is terrorists. But mm -hmm. almost all the terrorists that, it, you know, that were doing suicide bombings, it was their first crime. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so yeah. In, in three years, they had basically caught nobody. Yeah, that, I mean that's a general. The, the, uh, 
The UK has been on the vanguard of installing security cameras. It was in the early 90s and it was related to IRA, IRA bombings. Um, and and there, there is a face scanning system in one of the town squares in England, but they're mostly just installing regular old security, sort of dumb security cameras, if you will, rather than smart security cameras like this. Uh, there is one place where they've done it. Uh, Visionix love to tout how crime went down in that area. It's unclear why. Uh, not they never caught anybody, you know, uh, with the system. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, again, my website is Computer Bytes Man. I do have more information up there on face scanning. I'll also be here for questions. Thanks.